So it's so nice to be back with everybody here. Uh, um, we have had the opportunity to learn together in this series already. This is the, um, the fourth time uh, that we get to learn together um, and the third in this particular series around prayer. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, to opening up the Mourner's Kaddish with you and, uh, and diving in to unlocking the deeper meaning in what I think is one of the most misunderstood prayers in, uh, in the Jewish canon. And of course, one of the most frequently recited, um, the Kaddish, although not in, in the guise of Mourner's Kaddish, but the Kaddish itself is recited multiple times during any given um, service. And so, whereas the last two classes we spend time looking at the Amida, the standing prayer, which is the central prayer of each Jewish service. Um, uh, in terms of frequency, the, the Kaddish is even higher bang for your buck than, uh, than the Amida. And so we're really gonna have an opportunity to, um, to dive into that, uh, that well recited and well rehearsed prayer today. Um, what we're going to do just following the method that we've been using over these last few uh, sessions is to um, look at the prayer, the text of the prayer together. This is a, a series with Hadar about uh, diving into text, so we are going to look at the text of the prayer itself. We're going to make some comments about the history and, um, you know, origin of the Kaddish, which is, um, which is always interesting, but also a little bit murky. And we're going to um, look at some of the interpretations that may move us to other places and, and maybe uh, dealing with some of the big feelings that people have about Kaddish, um, you know, move it into other, um, other realms of possible interpretations. And we're going to do that using the method that we've been looking at throughout this series, which is texts that are quoted in the prayer as standing behind um, this prayer text and, and offering us the opportunity to extend the boundaries of what it might mean to interpret um, this prayer and any prayer in the Sidor, in the Jewish prayer book. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, uh, in a moment, I'm just gonna share the screen. Again, Ari is sharing the, the same text in the chat, um, uh, the, the source sheet there. I'm gonna share the screen. We're gonna read through um, the Kaddish and I'm gonna invite you to chat any questions that you have about the prayer. I'm favoring questions over comments, questions and then a question mark. Um, and that could be noticings that you uh, that you have curiosities that you have um, on any particular phrase or on the big the bigger questions that you might have about Kaddish. All of that uh, is invited into the into the chat. Um, again, as a, as interpreters, where the first step of interpretation is looking at something from a standpoint of curiosity and asking questions about it. Not every question needs to have an answer, but we're gonna. Um, elicit as many questions as we can about it. Um, so let me share the screen and we can dive in to this um, to this project together. Let's see here. Okay. Everybody can see can see the screen? Yeah? Okay. Great. So I, I'm going to read it. I, I sort of divided it up into seven sections, but those are those are my divisions. It's not there's nothing canonical about the numbers here. Um, but let me, we'll, I'll, I'll read it section by section in the, in the original and in the translation. And, uh, and, and along the way, I'm going to invite you to chat the questions that are coming up for you. Okay. Ba'agala u'bizman kariv v'imru amen. All right, I'm going to read it in the translation section by section. So section one, exalted and sanctified be his great name in the world which he created according to his will. And may he rule his kingdom in your lifetime and in your days and in the lifetime of all Israel speedily and in the near future and say amen. Okay, paragraph two, which is a short one. May his great name be blessed forever and ever and ever, or forever and all eternity. Uh, you can hear in the in the Aramaic the Alam uh, Almei Almaya, ever and ever and ever. It's the same word. Okay. Section three. 
blessed and praised and glorified and exalted and uplifted and honored and elevated and extolled be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is He. Section four. Let Ela mean kol birchata v'shirata tush bechata v'nechamata yamiran be'alma v'imru amen. That is above all the blessings and songs and praises and consolations which we utter in the world and say, Amen. Now we go from four to six because the full Kaddish, which includes section five, which is not the mourner's Kaddish, not the, the prayer that is reserved for mourners, uh, includes that, that section, but we're taking that out. But I'm just noting that there's a longer version of Kaddish that you say um, following each Amida in every prayer service and mourner's Kaddish removes that paragraph. So let's go to paragraph six. Yehei shlama rabba min shmaya, v'chayim aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru amen. May there be great peace from heaven and life for us and for all Israel and say amen. And now the last section, o se shalom v'imromav, hu ya se shalom aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru amen. You make peace in his high heavens, may you make peace for us and for all Israel and say Amen. And I took this translation from the Mitsuda Sidur, um, which is uh, sort of a traditional Orthodox text and sort of relatively faithful translation to the actual words. Uh, and so that's, um, that's where that translation is coming from. So I'm going to invite, and people have already started to do this, which is great, any questions that you might have about the, about the text itself before we dive into some of the history and interpretation that's going to set us up for some of the interpretations. So I'm going to open up the chat and start looking at the um, and start looking at the questions that you're uh, that you're posing here. Okay, I'm just scrolling back to the beginning. Um, okay, Sandria Kornblum is saying, "How did this prayer get associated with mourning?" And I want to point out, and this is really important. I'm glad you asked that question to kick us off. The the Kaddish as a prayer precedes the mourners' Kaddish. That is to say, the application of the Kaddish to be recited by mourners by about a thousand years. That is to say, this did not become a prayer for mourners to recite uh, until the Middle Ages. And uh, this, the, the prayer itself may date back as early as the first century. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of explore that possibility. So your question is actually a major guidance for the whole session that we're doing, which is to say, if I have a freestanding prayer and I want to apply it, to be said by mourners, why would I apply this prayer? What's the, um, the reasoning? What's the significance of saying this prayer uh, in the mouth of a mourner as opposed to just any other prayer that is in the prayer book or writing a new prayer for mourners? So what is it about this prayer that makes it appropriate for mourners to recite because it got applied to that population once it was already in circulation. And we're going to look at, well, what was, if this wasn't originally recited by mourners, what was the original function of the Kaddish? We're going to get some, uh, some exploration on that. Um, April saying, is the prayer in Aramaic? And I would say, you could put that in a, that's sort of a fact question. And, and I would say the answer to that is mainly, it's mainly in Aramaic, although there is Hebrew in it, like Hebrew Amen, and say Amen is Hebrew. Um, but, you know, it's mainly in Aramaic. And then I would say, well, why is it in Aramaic? Uh, the number of prayers in our Siddur that are written in Aramaic is fleetingly small. <laughs> There's almost no prayers that are said in Aramaic. So even if it's 80%, not 100% Aramaic, why is it recited in Aramaic? And Aramaic, again, is sort of um, the language, both the vernacular of Jews in a certain time period and the language of the Beit Midrash, the language of the Talmud is in Aramaic, uh, although mixed in with a lot of Hebrew. So, you know, is that connected and, and, and why are we saying it in Aramaic if it's mainly in Aramaic? Um, Ruth is asking the same question. Um, Sarah is, I think, giving, giving voice to a lot of people's strong feelings with the Kaddish. Um, and it's obviously associated with all the grief and loss that we have experienced either personally or, or friends of ours and relatives of ours. And therefore there's a lot that's wrapped up in it. And I thank you for sort of uh, highlighting your connection to the prayer and your difficulty with it and your emotions that you're bringing. I think you speak for a lot of people where there's a lot of, um, a lot of emotions here. Arnold's also talking about the Aramaic. Uh, Beth is saying, 
my lifetime versus my days. Yeah, in the first paragraph, why does it say your lifetime and your days? Those are synonyms, maybe. Does each one refer to something separate? It seems a little repetitive. Um, maybe the you, who is, who is the you that I'm addressing? Typically in a prayer uh, in the Sidur, I am I'm going to uh, you know, address the you, capital Y. That is to say, almost all prayers are directly addressed to God. One other exception to that rule is Barhu, right? Barhu uh, at Barach, that's the Aliyah that you say when you, when you go up to the Torah. You're actually speaking to the congregation. Bless God. Barhu at Barach. God is the third person object, and the, and the second person address is everybody there. You bless. It's a command. And it seems like we're also speaking in this prayer to the you, the assembled congregation. But why? Most of the prayers, the vast majority is speaking to God. Um, uh, okay, let's see. Why amen's in the middle and not just at the end, right? Are there certain sections to this prayer that got combined and maybe that's part of it? Why do we say amen throughout? Um, Debbie's saying, why are there so many synonym verbs, right? In section three, uh, you can hear it in the in the sort of, in the Aramaic even better than the Hebrew, right? Yitbarach, Yitshtabach, Yitbarach. They kind of ran out of synonyms in English. Like, can you tell me the difference between exalted and extolled, you know? Um, but but they're sort of running through these eight different terms. And if you add in Yitgadal and Yitgadash from the first line, there's 10 different praise words, it seems like, for God. So why are there so many? Why is that so important? Uh, Miriam saying consolations is uh, a bit surprising. That's in section four, right? God is above all blessings and songs and praises. We just bless God seemingly, and God is above all that. But what about consolations? That seems a little bit out of place. Although it is connected maybe to the morning elements, we're going to return to that. Uh, Carol saying, you know, what does this have to do with mourning? Exactly. It's not totally clear. It doesn't mention death or loss. Uh, it does mention consolation, but um, not exactly clear what that means. Um, why, Ruth is saying, why do we focus on praising God rather than on asking for comfort? Which returns us to our original question of why is this an appropriate prayer for mourners? Seems like a general praise of God. And that's what we're going to dive dive into and look at that um, uh, as well. Um, okay, seems to be in the future tense. We're gonna look at the at the tense here. Uh, Liz is saying, why did reform add Yoshebe Tevel? All the residents of the entire universe, God should bring peace not only to Israel, but also to everybody. That's a general trend in, uh, in modern times to make Israel less elect, even though that's hard to do in the Sidur. Um, uh, why is section five left out? Section five was specifically asking God to receive our Amida. Titabel Slothon, Sloth as the Amida. So you leave that out in the Mordor Scottish because it's not really related to the Amida. It's its own standalone prayer. Um, okay. Lori's saying, what does it mean? May he rule his kingdom in your lifetime and in your days. God already rules his kingdom in my view. And this is going to be a crux, sort of core question. Is God king right now, or am I asking for God to be king? I thought God was king. I'm pretty clear on that. So why am I asking for God to be king if God already is king? So that's going to be one of the um, one of the questions we're gonna we're gonna dive into. Mary and Jeff are saying was Kaddish recited at a time when the sacrifice when there was a temple. So probably not. Uh, it probably postdates the temple. However, there is a theory that Kaddish is connected to the Lord's Prayer um, in the book of Matthew. So it depends how old you think the book of Matthew is, um, right? But um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It, are, those are two phrases that you find in the Kaddish. Thy kingdom come, your kingdom should come, may you rule, is another theme that's found in the Kaddish. Actually, there's a whole book that was written on that compares the Lord's Prayer to the Kaddish. So maybe it's as old as the Lord's Prayer. Maybe they're both drawing from a kernel prayer that precedes it. Um, that's something that we're going to sort of not know the answer to, but putting that out there here. Okay, there's a lot of other questions that we're at, asking here, and we're going to dive in um, and take a look at, um, at, the, uh, at, at the sort of not answering all of them, but answering a bunch of them, or at least trying to approach them. I want to start off... Uh, this is sort of getting at a number of questions that um, were asked here. Why would a mourner say this? And for me, who grew up in the in the congregations that used the old Silverman Sidor, this is in the conservative movement published in the 40s, 
um, and, and got replaced in the 80s, but there was an introduction to the Kaddish that I put at the top of the sheet here, which the rabbi would recite every week before introducing the mourners uh, Kaddish and asking mourners to rise. And it, would, and it goes like this, in solemn testimony to that unbroken faith, which links the generations one to another, let all who are in mourning now rise to, sancti to magnify and sanctify God's holy name. So in this framing that was offered by Mara Silverman in the mid 20th century, the purpose of the Kaddish is to praise God. And who is praising God? The mourners. Um, right, and Wendy's saying that, that that has lived on in Sim Shalom and the next publication of the conservative movement. Actually, a version of it is in the Reconstruction of Sidor. The framing of the Kaddish as a praise of God, to my understanding, is unique to 20th century America. That is to say, the whole question of why would a mourner get up and praise God, almost like stoically praise God, like I am suffering, I am grieving, and nevertheless, I'm going to stand up and call God great, and I'm going to call God holy, and that's part of my unbroken faith that sort of supersedes the grief that I'm experiencing. That is a framing that I always thought was strange. I was like, you know, if, if you're mourning, why would you want to sort of unmitigated praise of God? Why is that it? Uh, why is that coming out of your mouth? And even more so, if this is a prayer that gets shifted into a mourner's mouth, uh, you know, taken from another context. So perhaps uh, you might ask, like, why is the why is the mourner not referencing the death and the grief, and instead praising God? So what I want to um, orient us to is a different understanding, what I think is the clear um, uh, understanding of these words that does not categorize this as a praise of God, but rather a request of God. Um, and, and, the, and the Mitsuda translation that I used here sort of is on the fence on which way it's going, which is why I liked it in the sense that I think a lot of us assume that when I say Yid Gadal vi Kadash, um, uh, using the, the words great and holy, I'm praising God for being great and holy. Um, exalted and sanctified be his great name sounds a lot like I'm calling God great uh, or exalted and, and holy. Um, and yet um, that is not the clear understanding of the words. The clear understanding of the words is not a praise, but rather a request. Now, there are basically only two forms of prayer in Jewish, uh, in, in the Siddur, in, Jew, in Jewish tradition. There is praise, and I would maybe say as a subset of that, thanks, like uh, hoda'ah um, uh, and shevach, those are the Hebrew terms, but basically I'm either thanking God or praising God, or bakasha, or a request. I'm asking God for something that doesn't exist currently. Um, and I think there's a category error that we have been led to believe in the 20th century American prayer books, in which the Kaddish is framed as a praise, not as a request, but in fact, it's a request and was always understood to be a request. Here's the request. The request is, may God be made great, may God be made holy, uh, or God's name rather, be made holy, in the world in which God created according to God's will, and may God become king. May God rule God's kingdom. Okay, so that's the request. It's a three-part request. There are three ver verbs, as it were, that are being applied to God. God, may you be great. May you be holy. May you rule. Those are requests that I am making that uh, are not about praising the current situation, but noticing how the current situation does not have God as great or holy, or ruling, which might fly in the face of what we thought we knew about God or how God is depicted in our prayer book, but indeed is the core orientation of the Kaddish. The Kaddish is a request, not a praise. Now, how am I saying that? Why, like, why, why am I going against Morris Silverman's framing here? I'm doing it basically on the method that we've looked at, which is how do these words show up in the Bible? So let's take a look at how these words show up in the Bible. Yitgadal kadash. may God, I'm translating now as may God be made great, may God be made holy. 
Where does that show up in the Bible? So let's let's scroll on down to look at that, even as we um, uh, are going to look at some of the other questions as well. Okay, so I'm I'm scrolling on down to page two, the second box on page two. Now the second box on page two is the prophecy of Ezekiel, Yechezkel, who gives a prophecy around the end of time. In the end of time, there is going to be a great battle between Gog and Magog. This is the, the characters who give us the English word Armageddon. So there'll be sort of like a final battle. And at the end of the battle, there will be um, sort of God's full rule and salvation will come. So let's take a look at the, um, at the quote from the Bible here, which is going to end with the terms that we're looking at in the Kaddish. So let's just start off on verse 18, chapter 38 of Ezekiel. On that day, when Gog sets foot on the soil of Israel, declares the Lord God, my raging anger shall flare up. For I have decreed in my indignation and in my blazing wrath on that day, the day of end of time, a terrible earthquake shall befall the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that move on the ground, and every human being on the earth shall quake before me. Mountains shall be overthrown, cliffs shall topple, every wall shall crumble to the ground. Okay, this is end of time. I will then summon the sword against them, against Gog, throughout my mountains, declares Lord God, and every man's sword shall be turned against his brother. I'll punish him with pestilence and with bloodshed, a poor torrential rain, hailstones, sulfurous fire upon him and his hordes, and the many peoples with him. Okay, this sounds like a biblical apocalypse. It is. Okay, this is the end of the world. And then we get verse 23. Let's take a look at it. Behit gadilti, behit kadishti, binodati le'enei goyim rabim. Thus will I manifest my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the sight of many nations, le'enei goyim rabim, and they shall know, v'yadu, they shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, so what happens here? First of all, this is the only time in all of the Bible that the terms yid gadal vid kadash, those two reflexive conjugations of be made great, be made holy, ever appear. And it's clear that this is not a description of the current world that we live in, but rather it is my, uh, my, my vision, Ezekiel's vision of what happens at the end of time, only at the end of time, only when all the nations know and recognize God will at that time God be made great and God be made holy, okay? So this is not a description of God right now. When we say it in the Kaddish, it is rather um, a request that God be, that may the world get to the state in which God is finally great and holy and ruling thy kingdom come. It's not here now, but I want it to come. What does that mean? I thought, I thought God is king. Well, God is king for me. Maybe God is king for the Jewish people. But God is not king for all of humanity. Not all the nations have recognized God. If they did, things would look and feel different. <laughs> so that's part of the orientation of this prayer, which is to say, this is a prayer that is starting off with a plaintive request, with a plea. May you be made great. May you be made holy. May you rule. And just to bring you some of the, uh, the ratification of this, I brought a few uh, commentators on the Kaddish from the Middle Ages who are making this the plain understanding, meaning for them it's no question. In the beginning, at first, this is uh, Rav Haigaon from the 10th century, um, he requests, he requests, the, the worshiper requests from God, to hurry his promise as he promised us through his prophet, and then quotes our verse from Ezekiel. So commenting on the Kaddish, Kadash, citing the verse from Ezekiel, and saying the worshiper is making a request. May God, may you be made great. May you be made holy. Let's just look at a couple more. Um, page three, uh, the school of Rashi, a book called Sefer Apardes, Rashi, 11th century France. He's saying this is the meaning of May God's name be magnified and sanctified. In the future, his name should be made great and sanctified uh, as it's written. And then he quotes our verse. For right now, 
He is not written as he is called. He's called Adonai, but he's written Yud Hey Vav That is to say, God is not fully aligned with the fullness of what God's name could be. We only pronounce a nickname of God. We don't pronounce the actual four-letter name of God. And that's a stand-in for God is not fully revealed. God is not fully available or ruling for everybody. Okay? So this is the idea. Again, if you sort of learn nothing else today about the Kaddish, it's the shifting on the orientation of this is not a praise. This is a request. I want you to be great. I want you to be holy. I want you to rule, even though that's not the case right now. And that could be something that is reasonably put in the mouth of a mourner who might be feeling very acutely, yeah, the world I'm living in right now is God is not great. God is not holy. God is not ruling to the fullest extent that God could. And I want, maybe without all the apocalyptic civil war, but I want to achieve and get to that other existence where God is fully great, even though God is not currently great. Okay, so that's just, again, the framing of the Kaddish and where, where, where we are finding some clues about why this might be put in the mouth of a mourner. Now, I said that this was not originally a mourner's prayer. Let's take a look at, well, what was it originally? How did the Kaddish function originally? Uh, so I'm going to scroll back up for a minute to the top of page two. And I think this Midrash, although it's a Midrash, that is say it's an exegesis, of a certain um, uh, a certain verse originally, it actually, according to scholarship, gives the most most faithful view of what the Kaddish originated as, which is to say, it originates as a coda to the act of study, uh, to the act of Torah learning. Let's take a look at this. The top of page two on the box, Midrash Mishle, the Midrash on. Uh, the book of Proverbs, we have this statement from Rabbi Ishmael. Rabbi Ishmael says, at the moment when Israel's gathered in the study houses and hears a teaching from a wise one, from a chacham, from a sage, afterwards they answer, Amen Yehei Shmei Rabba Mivarach, which is actually the old way the Kaddish was referred to. It wasn't called the Kaddish. It was called Yehei Shmei, which is the second paragraph in our text. Um, in that moment, the Holy Blessed One is joyful and rises in his world. Okay, so what's the, what's the original context of reciting this prayer? You hear a teaching from a sage, and after hearing the teaching, then you recite, may God's name be, uh, be blessed, okay? And that, um, that's how we experience the Kaddish in our services. Like if you've been there on Saturday or Mondays or Thursdays, after you read the Torah, there's a Kaddish that's recited. After all the Aliyot are finished, there's a Kaddish that's recited. That's probably the best original locus for the Kaddish. You learn something, you studied something, you heard the Torah being read, and then you follow that with the Kaddish. Now, why this prayer was recited after study gets back to this question of what is the real meaning of the prayer and what element that we're playing out here is, yeah, the world that we live in now is not the fully God revealed and great world that we can live in, that we want to live in. And maybe when I study, I experience the, the, the learning as a taste of a world to come that I know that I'm not currently living in. Um, so that was the original locus. Again, scholars have identified this and perhaps that's why it's in Aramaic. In other words, Aramaic is the language of the Beit Midrash. There was a, a theory that it was all because Jews didn't understand Hebrew, but they did understand the vernacular, which is Aramaic, and they wanted this to be a popular prayer that everyone understood. So even if the rest of the prayer book was like unintelligible Hebrew, at least you would understand this. That then fell out of favor in scholarship. And instead, it was sort of like, you know what? The Aramaic that we're using in the Kaddish isn't street Aramaic. It's not vernacular. It's Beit Midrash Aramaic. It's the, it's the, the language of the study house. And indeed, it's recited after studying. So it makes sense to recite it in the language of the study and the language of the Talmud. Um, in, in that way, there's sort of like, it makes sense that it has that other language there as opposed to all the other prayers in the prayer book, which are entirely in Hebrew. Okay, these again are some of the theories that are out there, but the, what's clear is it's not originally a mourner's prayer. In fact, the whole idea of saying mourner's Kaddish, of having a yard site, all the mourning practices, 
that we associate with the Kaddish and with minion attendance only arise in the Middle Ages. Um, so it's so sort of like a last step in the Jewish people's relationship to the prayer book is mourners have a specific and new special role as leaders. And that itself, even though our current experience of that, it's like, of course, the, the minion is, is you know, made up of people saying Kaddish. I will show up for the minion to help people say Kaddish. All that is an orientation that's only about a thousand years old. And there's some shift when that takes place that also privileges this prayer as something to be recited by mourners and not just by the prayer, the prayer leader alone. Okay, so to sum up, the, the Kaddish is not originally a mourner's prayer, but gets put in the mouth of a mourner. Why might it be put in the mouth of the mourner? Not because a mourner wants to stand up and stoically praise God, but rather because a mourner, more than anybody, recognizes that the world we live in is not the world that I want to live in. I'm grieving, I'm experiencing God as not fully great, not fully holy, not fully king. And I wanna pray for a world in which that changes. And so in that way, it makes sense for a mourner to recite this request as opposed to a praise. Okay, that's all Yit Kadal Bid Kadash. Let's take a look at the other core text, core part of this prayer, that is labeled here as section number two. Uh, section number two, Yehei Shmei Rabba Mibarach, Ve'olam Olomei Now, this is, this is the part that we know as the congregational response. This is what everybody says once the leader kicks us off with paragraph one and says to us, not to God, but to us, Bimru Amen, say Amen, they're speaking to us, the congregation, not only do we say amen, but we also say this line, may his great name be blessed forever and ever and ever. And you're going to pardon that I'm going to use the, the, the pronoun here, even though it's, it's a male pronoun. Um, I don't intend to, uh, to telecast that God is male. But what I want us to notice is the name of God is not in this prayer. <laughs> Meaning all, when we started in line one, we originally jumped to exalted and sanctified, may, may God be, but I didn't say God. What did I say? May Shimei, may God's name, but I didn't say God's name. I said his name, Shimei, which is Sh Hebrew is Shemo, his name. May his name be made great and be holy. In, in section two, Yehei Shimei, may his great name be blessed. Why? Am I not referring to God directly? This is, I would say, a core question for the Kaddish because in Jewish prayer, we are not shy about mentioning God's name. God's name is all over our prayer book. In fact, you can't even recite a legal blessing without God's name. If all you said was blessed or blessed be he or the Holy One blessed be he, you wouldn't actually fulfill the requirement of what it means to recite a blessing. You need to have God's name explicitly in the liturgy. So given that that's, I mean, you could have imagined a world in, it seems like Dead Sea Scroll uh, community might've gone this way. You could have imagined a world, but no, no, no. We don't pronounce God's name. We don't even pronounce a nickname for God's name, like Adonai. We, don't, we just don't say it at all. But that's not the world of Jewish liturgy. Jewish liturgy is saying God's name all, all over the place, um, but not in the Kaddish. God's name is not in the Kaddish. So that is one of the mysteries that we're going to have to unlock next, okay? So number one is, this is a request, not a praise. Number two is, where is God's name? Where did it go? And I'm going to show us in just a minute. I expected God's name to be in line two, and it wasn't there. So as we noted, the, the, the main elements of Jewish prayer are, are just quotes from the Bible. So you can expect that line two also is a quote from the Bible. May his great name be blessed forever and ever and ever. Let's see where that shows up in the Bible and strengthen this question of where did God's name, uh, where did God's name go? Okay, I'm scrolling on down. Let's take a look at the middle of page three from Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter two. Now, the Bible is almost entirely in Hebrew. 
But there are certain sections that are in Aramaic, including the book of Daniel. Daniel is a prophet who is living in exile after the destruction of the, of the first temple. And we get the following uh, phrase in the book of Daniel. The mystery was then revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven, Elah, oh, sorry, Elah Shemaya. And Daniel answered and said, in, in verse 20, Leha, I'm going to read in the Aramaic first, then the English, Lehave Shmei de Allah Mevara, mean Alma Bad Alma, right? Which sounds a lot like Yehe Shmei Rabba Mevara, Elamo Meomaya, Leave Shmei de Allah Mevara, mean Alma Bad Alma, or in the English, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. All the elements are there. Let there, Yehe, Leave. The name of Shimei, Vivarach, be blessed. Le'olamo me'o maya, I mean, ama bad ama, from forever and ever and ever. All the four elements are there. Only difference is, in the book of Daniel, what do you have that you don't have in our prayer? The word God. In Daniel, the name of God. Allah, Elohim, it's there, but not in our prayer text. So what happened to the name of God? Meaning, I'm quoting like word for word the book of Daniel, but I've removed the, the reference to God. So again, with a biblical mindset, if I'm aware of the context that's happening in the, in the, in the prayers here, the possibility, I'm expecting, oh yeah, Daniel, you're quoting that verse from Daniel. Wait a minute, where did the name of God go? And the other places in the Bible where we say, Yehei Shmei, God, Mibarach, may the name of God be blessed. We also have the name of God spelled out. Let's look at it in the book of Job, right? Um, Yehi Shem Adonai Mibarach, may the name of God, not Shemo, Yehi Shmo Mibarach, rather the name of God. It's mentioned explicitly. Or in Psalm 113, we know it from Hallel, from the Seder, from the Haggadah. Yehi Shem Adonai Mibarach, may Atavi Adolam. That's just the Hebrew version of. May let the name of God be blessed forever, for now and forever. Um, but the Adonai, the yud right, that's there, is mentioned explicitly. So all I'm trying to say is our line in the Kaddish should be shocking because it should have quoted God, a word for God, whether it's yud Bave or Allah, Elohim, and it doesn't. This is all to emphasize to us that God's name is missing. Then you scratch your head and you say, well, you know, this prayer doesn't mention death. It only mentions life. That's true. But the other thing that this prayer doesn't mention is God. <laughs> that is a shocking turn of events for a, for a prayer. And it's a relatively long prayer. There's plenty of room to mention God. Uh, but it's not mentioned. God, God's name is not mentioned explicitly. I'm assuming when I say, Shemei, Shemei, his name, that I'm referring to God, but I could be referring to like Bob, you know, or wh whatever. Like it doesn't, there's no antecedent to his name. And that's meant, I think, to raise up for us the experience of a world in which God is not fully present. If I have a system of liturgy in which one of the few rules of what counts for liturgy is and mention God's name explicitly, you don't mention God's name. You haven't really done a bracha. And then I give you a prayer where God's name is not mentioned directly. And I'm expecting it to come from the biblical verse that I'm quoting and alluding to. Then my experience as the worshiper should be, wait a minute. Where's the name of God? How come I'm not saying God's name in this prayer? And that opens up a whole other window into a world in which the Kaddish is representative of a world in which God is not fully present which of course is a very common experience of a mourner. A mourner does not wake up in their grief and say, I'm experiencing God's glory. Meaning they might, I want to take away emotions from, from, from the mourner, but I think a common experience of being a mourner is I'm feeling the absence of God. Now, this is not just something that I'm drawing on my own conclusion, but actually comes from the earliest mention of the Kaddish in the Talmud. So I want to take a look at that with you next. Uh, we're on page four. Top of page four. This is the beginning of the Talmud, page three of the Talmud, um, 
in which we get a story about Rabbi Yossi, one of the early rabbis, who lives in the period of the destruction of the Second Temple. And let's see what happens to Rabbi Yossi in this moment, where our prayer, the Kaddish, has got to make an appearance. So Abraita teaches, an old rabbinic teaching is as follows. Rabbi Yossi said, one time I was walking along the path and I entered a ruin from one of the ruins of Jerusalem in order to pray, to pray li palel. In rabbinic parlance, that means to say the Amida. So he goes and he's davening the Amida. He's praying the Amida, the standing prayer in one of the ruins of Jerusalem. What happens next? Because it's the Talmud. Elijah, of blessed memory, came and watched the doorway until I finished my prayer, until I finished the Amida. So Elijah appears and is going to have an interaction with Rabbi Yossi. And this is what Elijah says to Rabbi Yossi. He said to me, whenever the Israelites go into the synagogues and schoolhouses and respond, Yehei Shmei Rabba Mevorach, or in some manuscripts, Yehei Shmei Agadol Mevorach, may his great name be blessed. Whenever Israel says, may his great name be blessed, God shakes God's head and says, Happy is the king who is thus praised in his house, right? So let's stop here for just one second. Elijah's reporting that when Israel recites the phrase, Yehei Shmei Rabbah Mevorach, may his great name be blessed, God loves it. God shakes God's head and says, yeah, this I am happy to be praised as in this way, okay? But then Elijah goes on with the report and says as follows, Woe to the father who had to banish his children, and woe to the children who had to be banished from the table of their father. Right? This has a sort of tragic element and ending to the interaction. Elijah says, on the one hand, when Israel uh, says, Yehoshmei Rabbah Mavrach, may God's great name be blessed, God loves it, and God experiences it as a joy. But immediately, we then turn to the current reality in which Jerusalem is ruined and God is in mourning. Woe to the father. Oi, God is the father in this, in this parable. Woe to the father. Actually, the Talmud can't handle God having woe. And so they, um, they edit it in a pious edit and change oi, woe, to ma, what? <laughs> Um, but that's only in the printed version of the Talmud and all the manuscripts that has oi. God's actually woe to the father. God is suffering as a result of the expulsion and the destruction. And the children, we are suffering as a result of the destruction and the expulsion. So what you have here is two elements happening simultaneously. On the one hand, you have God uh, enjoying the experience of being praised in God's house, Yehei Shmei Rabbah Mevorah. But at the same time, God is then brought into the current reality of destruction and ruins and saying, woe is me and woe is you. Now, this is something, again, that makes a lot of sense for mourners to experience and to recite. And to be clear, who is the mourner in this version of understanding the text? It's not just the human who is in grief for their loss of another human, but also God is in a state of mourning over the world, over destroyed Jerusalem. Now, if that sounds strange, like a God who is suffering and in mourning, as opposed to a God who controls everything, and hey, why did my relative die if you're in charge? Like, and I would have rage against God who's all powerful. But here it's not painting that picture of God, it's painting a picture of God who is in league with us as mourners. This is a strand of rabbinic thinking about God. I wanted to bring you one commentary on this section of the Talmud that really brings this home in a kind of a shocking way, just theologically. So they're quoting our section of the Talmud, uh, Tosfat Arosh, we're in the Middle Ages here. Um, uh, and, and, and the Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher, um, who's living in the 13th century, says, immediately the Holy, one, the Holy Blessed One shakes his head. That's the quote from the Talmud. This is related to what we say in the Kaddish, praises and comforts 
that God needs, as it were, comforts, tanchumim, because of the sorrow around destruction. Now let's just unpack this for a second because it's kind of an amazing read of the Kaddish. You remember in the Kaddish we said God is above. God is Laela. God is above. I'll just scroll up to there so we'll look at it together. God is above in um, paragraph four. God is above all blessings and songs and praises. Okay, I, I, I ask God to be blessed and praised and glorified. May God be blessed and praised makes sense. Even though God's above all blessings and songs and praises, we saw last week how you can't really describe God, um, that God is above all human language. But then it has this strange word, which is pointed out in the chat, and consolations. God is above all nechemata. So that implies just following the structure here of not only have I, I'm attempting to bless God, may God be blessed, even though God's above all blessing, may God be praised, even though God's all above all praise. Now I'm adding, may God be comforted, which is in parentheses, even though God is above all comfort. So what the Rosh is explaining to us is the Kaddish is attempting to comfort God, even though God's above all comfort. Because God is suffering as a result of the world being in the state that it is. Okay? That is an unusual, for our 20th, 21st century view of Judaism and Judaism's view of God, that is not a, a, a popular view that God suffers as a result of the state of the world, that God's mourning over the destruction in the world. There was another neighboring religion that really took the suffering God and ran with it. But that is a very clear strand of rabbinic thought that God is upset. God is uh, troubled in the deepest way by the sufferings of humanity. And I wanna close with two, um, two modern uh, uh, 20th century texts that are playing out this aspect of God. Okay, so I'm scrolling on down to the bottom of page four. So the first is from uh, David Wolpe, a, a contemporary Californian rabbi who wrote a beautiful book called Healer of Shattered Hearts, which is a view of God, not as the all-powerful marionetting of the world, but rather the one who is involved in our suffering and helping to uh, console us. He writes as follows about the conception of God as suffering along with our pain. The concept of a God who is himself pained by the suffering of his children is a powerful and rich idea. The Midrashic God mourns just as human beings do, sitting in sackcloth, weeping, walking barefoot. This is the Midrash, the rabbinic interpretation of the Book of Lamentations, where God is a character who is mourning among the mourners of Israel. Wolpe goes on, perhaps most poignantly, God reverses the famous verse in Isaiah, Comfort, oh comfort, my people, says your God. May you be comforted, O people Israel, to a plea that the people assuage his pain. Comfort me, comfort me, O my people. So it's not just that God is comforting us as mourners, but God needs our comfort because God is in mourning. That is a rabbinic understanding of God's position in the world. Wolpe goes on, God is not only suffering, but turns to human beings as they so often turn to him to salve the wounds of this world. And that's again, what I wanna argue is part of the dynamic of the Kaddish. When we say, Yehei Shmei Rabba Mivorach, we are on the one hand asking for God to be blessed, but we're also pointing out that the word God is not in our prayer. Therefore, I'm reflecting a world in which God's presence is diminished. And God is in need of the comfort, even though God's above all co comfort and consolation. In other words, there's something about saying the Kaddish that's not just meant to comfort the mourner, but also meant to comfort God who stands in league with the mourner. Now, the last piece I wanna bring here um, is uh, this piece by the Ish Kodesh. The Ish Kodesh is the rabbi of the Warsaw Ghetto. And the rabbi of the Warsaw Ghetto, um, uh, the Pietzner Rebbe, 
is an amazing figure who gave a weekly Devar Torah, a weekly exposition of the Torah portion for um, two plus years as, uh, uh, as, as somebody who was in the, in the ghetto himself until he was taken, uh, taken off and killed by the Nazis. And incredibly, his students buried his teachings and they were discovered after the war some of them by his students who survived, who found one canister, and another was discovered in the 60s by a Polish construction worker who dug out this canister, and both of these are put together and published. This is, I mean, if you're talking about uh, a community that is suffering, the community of the Warsaw Ghetto is right up there. And so the Eish Kodesh says the following, uh, commenting on our um, passage in the Talmud, in which uh, Elijah appears to Rebbe Yossi. He says, now the Jew who's tormented by his afflictions thinks that he alone suffers, as if all his personal afflictions and those of all of Israel do not affect God above, God forbid, right? We suffer and we think God is not impacted. That's sort of the Aristotelian, Maimonidean view of God, the unmoved mover. God is out there, I'm suffering, God has no role, no emotional connection to my suffering. We feel that sometimes. But, says the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto, but scripture states, however, behold saratam lo tsar. In all of their troubled, lo, which they brilliantly reread as he, as opposed to not, he was troubled. Uh, a sort of rereading of Isaiah 63. And the Talmud states, when a person suffers, what does the Shechina say? What does God's presence say? My head is too heavy for me. My arm is too heavy for me. Our sacred literature tells us that when a Jew is afflicted, God, blessed be he, suffers, as it were, much more than the person does. So what I'm trying to present to you here in the Kaddish um, is a, an understanding of uh, this prayer making a lot of sense for a mourner to recite. Because on the one hand, this is a prayer in which we say, God, you're not great, not holy, not ruling fully but I want you to be, I want you to be ruling, I want you to be great, I want you to be holy, let's get there. That's the request in the beginning. And then I'm gonna say a line that seems like a praise of God. May his name be, his great name be blessed forever and ever. But in saying that line, I'm giving I'm sort of a tell that I don't experience God's presence as strong as I should. I'm not saying God's name where it belongs in this line, even though it's there in Daniel, it's there in Job, it's there in Psalms. It's not there in this, in this liturgical phrase. And part of that is signaling that in the story of Rabbi Yossi, when God hears the mourner's Kaddish, God is in need of comfort and maybe experiencing the Kaddish as comforting, even though God is above all consolation. We can't fully inhabit the, um, the image. It, it is a metaphor at the end of the day, but it's one in which God is playing a role, not as the cause of our grief, but in league with our suffering um, and, uh, and mourning. And, uh, and that is sort of how I would recast, based on the biblical sources of this prayer, the mourner's Kaddish. So let me stop here, turn it back over to Ari for any- uh, Awesome. Well, I have a few questions. I People were asked so many um, great points. This is, a, this is a, you know, CSP is a great group, very smart and great questions, great um, additions. Thank you everybody for sharing your questions and your thoughts. Here's some things that I just want to make sure we covered. One question was, can we only say the Kaddish with a minion? And if so, why? Great. So can we only say that this is a question that got asked over and over again in, in, uh, in COVID, you know, what constitutes a minion? The Kaddish is only able to be recited with a minion, even though interestingly, in the list in the Mishnah, the oldest rabbinic text of what needs a minion to be recited, the Kaddish is not on the list. That's probably because the Kaddish doesn't rise as a prayer that defines Jewish prayer spaces until well after the second century when the Mishnah was there. So, all authorities agree you need a minion to recite the Kaddish, but that was a newer, the Kaddish itself comes on the scene later than the list of things that you need a minion for. Um, you know, the follow-up question is why? 
why <laughs> why can't we make the Kaddish an exception and allow it to be done without a minion if necessary? So yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if we can answer that one, but yeah. So why is I mean, it doesn't explain? There is some sort of basic technical function of I'm speaking to you, not to God, and you plural. So I at least need some crowd to be there. And then at some point, you know, there are other things that the Mishnah does list that need 10 and not three. And that seems to align more with what the Kaddish represents. And so I think it just became easy. Once we're already out of, uh, this is something I could say on my own, speaking to people, then it made sense to fold it into the world of, yeah, people equals 10. And I looked it up. There's actually five versions of the Kaddish. Is that correct? And there I, are so, five versions of the Kaddish. Yeah. yeah. Four of them are not mourners. So four of them um, are really based on some learning or something, you know, based on learning, I would say. Um, there's a special one when you finish like uh, studying a, a, uh, a piece of Torah, like a, 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 a sugiya or a whole um, book of Talmud. And then one we're all familiar with is what we say throughout most of the service is not a mourner's cottage. We have, I think, two and two maybe in a Shabbat morning service, for example. So most of it is not for mourners. Um, but my question is, why do we have so many cottages in our morning service? Why not just have two? Yeah, or, or one, <laughs> like all the other prayers. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. The cottage functions uh, essentially in four different ways. One is, after a piece of study. So in a service in which you read the Torah, you're gonna to say the Kaddish. It also function as another opportunity to say to God, please accept this prayer that I just recited, which is the Amida. So at every service, there's always one Amida, one Kaddish. If you have two Amidas, two Kaddishes. That's the second role, Kaddish is please accept this prayer. And then the third role is the one we've been talking about, mourners recite it. And then the fourth one is basically as a marker between different sections. Uh, and so it's not the end of a section of study, but it's the end of a section of prayer. And that's what we call the half Kaddish, which might be the original shortest form of the Kaddish. So once you add up all those different opportunities, that's why you say it over and over again. Great. Thank you. So um, we're almost out of time. People have asked, can I share the chat? And the answer is yes. I will share the chat with everybody in the follow-up to this program as well. I read um, Leon, Weaseltier's, Le Leon Weaseltier's book many years ago at Kaddish. I thought it was excellent. So I don't know if it holds up. I think it probably does. So I'll, I'll keep that in and I'll share that with everybody in the yes, follow-up. but if you can make your way through it, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was a very impressive book. I remember reading that. Um, can you tell us, so um, tell us what we're studying with you next week in the final class in the series. Yes. Yeah, so, so next week, we're going to be doing non-cognitive aspects of prayer. We've been looking really closely at the words of prayer, but so much of prayer is about music and body and space and all the other ways in which we experience prayer. And we're going to look at some of the ways in which our sages have thought about the non-cognitive aspects of what it means to pray as a Jew. And since you are one of the three that founded Hadar, and then we have uh, Rabbi Ethan Tucker tonight, and Rabbi Shai Hill at the end, can you tell us something about those two so people know what to expect from your co-founders? Yeah, uh, Ethan and Shai and I were all undergraduates together in college in the mid-1990s. And uh, in the early 2000s, we put together Hadar as uh, our response to what we thought the Jewish world needed in terms of community building and Jewish learning. Um, they're fantastic teachers. Um, Ethan is an expert in Jewish uh, law and Shai is a, an expert in Jewish thought. And you're really in for a treat. So I hope you'll be able to join. And you all attended Harvard, correct? We did. So did you sit around at Harvard and say, one day we're going to start our own school? Did, that, <laughs> did you have those discussions or is that kind of your friendship was there and this came later? Did you? Yeah, did this you... came later. I wanted to be a journalist who was a crusading journalist. And uh, I did that for a little while then got sucked into the family business. Uh, so here I am. Yeah. Okay, everybody. So, hey, look all the stuff you have to think about now when you go to davening this week. Uh, or tomorrow or tonight. <laughs> so um, thank you for uh, taking us in an in-depth tour of just a part of the Kaddish. There's probably a lot more obviously to unpack. And um, I look forward to our class uh, next week. Also again tonight, Rabbi Ethan Tucker, for those of you who are members of our Legacy Circle and uh, benefactors and patrons as a thank you to helping to underwrite this program so we could do um, programs like this throughout the year. And um, I will share the chat. Again, terrific questions from so many sources, including Debbie Moline, 
a big fan, I think, of Ellie Count for out here. And if you're in Orange County, Debbie Lean urges you to do the bike ride for Chazon. You'll be hearing all about that. Um, so much to do in the world, and uh, we can't do everything, but we can do little things. And one of them is learning, one of them is maybe biking for a good cause. So take care, everybody. Be safe. Um, keep yourself uh, healthy as you can so we can have you back and participating in our chat. Have a great day. See you tonight. Bye.